This week's episode of Golf Smarter Mulligans is brought to you by DynamicGolfers.com. If there's one thing about Golf Smarter that surprises me, it's the wide range of ages that are drawn to our interviews. And mostly what I hear from golfers over 50 is that they're losing distance, and how can I get that back? And from golfers under 50 all over the world, the question is, how do I gain more distance? But every single one of these golfers wants to hear about a new club, a new swing, a new ball. But let me tell you a secret that I've learned from having conversations with golf instructors who work at driving ranges, public courses, private clubs, and even with tour pros. There's one basic tool you already have that will increase the distance you want and the distance you've lost. It's your body. You don't have to let age get in the way of a powerful golf swing. You need to fight back aging by increasing your flexibility and mobility. That's why I'm so excited to introduce you to DynamicGolfers.com to get you on a training program that will have you hitting the ball better and having you feeling better when you're not on the course. I've been on the Dynamic Golfers Functional Mobility Program every morning for a number of weeks now, and over the next few months, I'll be sharing my own experiences with Dynamic Golfers on both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans. Their targeted mobility and stretching program for golfers can accelerate recovery, eliminate hip and low back pain, and restore a healthy range of motion. Dynamic Golfers provides daily video routines that are only 15 to 20 minutes long, and each video targets muscle imbalance specifically designed for golfers. And that's what impressed me the most. After years of searching, I finally found a morning workout program that's going to help this aging golfer's body. And for only $9.99 a month, you can join over 4,000 golfers worldwide that make dynamic golfers part of their daily routine. And they've even created a custom landing page for us at dynamicgolfers.com slash golfsmarter. Go there now to get a seven-day free trial and 15% off your membership when you check out using the coupon code GOLFSMARTER. So please, check them out today and let me know what you think. If it's easier to remember GolfSmarter.com, do that. Then just click on the banner at the top of our homepage. But don't forget to take advantage of their discount offer. Use the checkout code GOLFSMARTER at DynamicGolfers.com slash GOLFSMARTER. We thank them so much for their support, their interest, and for helping us feel better. Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans. Your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. I love stealing little quotes and ideas from my friends, and Jim Hardy's one of my best buddies. And one of the nuggets I pulled away is he said one time in a story that the target may be the greatest interrupter of good golf. His point in saying that was that we're playing a game that requires you to swing in a circle. If you lean toward the target, if your hands drive out toward the target, if the club head swings out toward the target, you've interrupted the natural circle. So for me, I swung on the natural circle with my short game. But I knew as soon as he said that, my long game, which is the part of the game I had struggled with a big piece of my career, I was moving my body and my club too much toward the target. I wasn't just swinging in a circle and letting that take care of the ball flying where I was looking. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Our guest today played on the PGA Tour for over 20 years has coached a handful of golf's top players like Paul McGinley, Jay Haas, and Sergio Garcia, and has written three golf books, including his newest, which we'll get into right now. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Stan. Thanks for having me, Fred. Oh, it's a joy because I've been enjoying your new book, The Art of Scoring, The Ultimate On-Course Guide to Short Game Strategy and Technique. And just the title alone made me think a lot especially where I found I was losing strokes um, inside 100 yards. 
certainly my first two books had uh, a lot to do with technique. And the concept behind this one is really to, uh, as much as anything, help the, the readers begin to analyze their short game, begin to think more like a tour player than someone who had just kind of hit shots but not really considered all the options. And how can the recreational player like myself, I mean, I'm out there at best right now a couple times a month. You know, life just gets in the way of golf sometimes. Um, And if I have the opportunity to go out and swing the clubs, I'd prefer to go out and play than practice. But the concept of thinking like a tour player, let's expand on that. I think, first of all, you know, my opinion is golf is recreational. It's supposed to be fun. Thank you. So, <laughs> so I want the experience to be what the person participating is, is hoping for. And some people are out there to compete with their buddies. Some people are out there just to enjoy the fresh air. And, and some people are just, you know, they, they enjoy doing something athletic and going and swinging the club. So first and foremost, I think I, I want to coach the student in a manner that lets them enjoy the game better. I tell lady beginner ladies all the time, I said, look, you, you're not playing in a tournament. If it makes it more fun when you go pay your $100 to play golf, to tee it up every shot, tee it up every shot. You know, bring some enjoyment to the game uh, in the beginning. I think a person like yourself who doesn't get to practice a lot, you know, first and foremost, you decide kind of going up front. Do Am I trying to shoot a score today? And then what might be the kind of safe options, worst-case scenario plays around the green you could make? Or am I going out there to have fun and, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit some shots that I may not pull off today, but they'll be fun trying. And, and I think that approach alone uh, sometimes gets missed. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the idea of it – they'd be fun trying them um, can really change your day because I've not only personally experienced, but also witnessed a lot of people that uh, when they do have a a shot that they're not happy with, it can impact their entire day. They can get miserable. Well, you know, I think that's where you decide up front. Uh, I, I love to, Take the approach, if, if I'm asking you for something and, and my attitude is, it's okay if you answer no, then, you know, there's no big letdown on my end. And I think you can take the same approach to golf sometimes. You, you realize you're taking a risk-reward scenario and, hey, it's a, it's a rush if, if you pull it off, but you can't be overly disappointed if it doesn't work because you know you're, you're trying a risky shot. Right, right. I'll tell you, um, something you mentioned a moment ago, uh, while I was reviewing StanUtley.com, um, you have the friendly rules of golf, of a short video that you have on there. Uh, I got to believe some of your buddies on the tour, or even those people who are so caught up in the rules of the game, have to believe that some of the things you talked about are heresy. Well, I think... <laughs> that was uh that was a video promoting Greyhawk. So we were having a little fun with that one. So I, I I I do I do like I said before though, you know, if if you're paying your money to go play golf and it's a recreational day, it's not a day where you're trying to earn a living or you're trying to play by the USGA rules. Give yourself a break. Have some fun. You know, you don't you don't have to beat it out of the desert every time or uh you know, take it quite so serious. I mean, you even advocate on there, and I'm not going to, you know, advocate may be too strong a word, but you even suggest, hey, if you don't want to hit it out of the sand, toss it out of the sand. Yeah. <laughs> give, give, give it a try first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or tee it up over the water. That's um, right. Your second shot. I found myself in that scenario last week in the fries. I was like, 
wow, I wonder if they'll let me kind of drag this out and use a tee, because this is a hard shot. <laughs> I, I, I mean, right where I shot that video, I was off at the creek. Oh, is you know, that where, right? I had to, where I had to chip out, I was like, I could really use a tee here. It would help a lot. <laughs> but this is the fries open, right? Yeah, they, I couldn't quite pull that off in the fries. You didn't even turn around and look at the, uh, the judge who was following you going, can I just... Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more about your book. Um, it's interesting because uh, I, to be completely honest with you, uh, the first part of it, uh, first half seemed very technical. And I know a lot of people love the technical stuff. Uh, you get into um, things uh, on various shots, but you talk specifically about the grip, about your posture, about your stance. And then in the back part of the book, you really caught me because you talked more about strategy. You talked more about the art of scoring. Well, I, I think, first of all, when, when I haven't read a lot of golf books, I'm not a huge reader. Mm -hmm. The books that were most enjoyable to read for me were Bob Rotella's books, just because he got his point across by telling stories. And so I tried to create some balance in my books because there had to be some technique involved, but I hoped that my books did have some storytelling and it wasn't all, you know, positions and, and perfect grip and posture. And so I, I think that's where you kind of see a blend of both in the book. And uh, I know that uh, for me, I, it's, it's more enjoyable to read about, you know, things that I might have taught a tour player and how they analyze their shots versus just, okay, look at these pictures and here's how you put your hands on it. Yes. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the, the anecdotal stories um, fly by and ha may even last longer in my mind. Than, but, but I do want to talk about um, like what you called a very scary shot for most people, which is – go ahead. Tell, tell me which one. The bunker shot. Yeah, and particularly a longer bunker shot. Yes. You know, I think that was the one I addressed. The, the shot that's 50 yards, 40 yards, you really, you, you know up front that the the shot that you play from 15 or 20 yards to the last shot isn't going to get the job done because your skill set's not that high. And what I share with people is that I want to position my setup and purpose my swing to actually skull the ball on purpose. But the idea is I'm going to hit a skull below the equator of the ball. When that happens, uh, one, you don't have to swing too hard because uh, the ball is going to come out faster. But but it with just a tiny bit of practice, it becomes more predictable than trying to make a full swing and gauge that, hey, I'm going to have a, a bunch of sand or a little sand between me and the ball and the club face. Let's talk technique a little bit about that shot because you go into uh, the grip and and your posture. I thought it was real interesting about talking about your posture in there and even the details of the club face and how not just striking the ball but where it should end up after your swing. Well, I think in order to make the contact that I just spoke about where you're trying to hit the ball first before the sand uh, – to me, the way I was kind of taught and it was explained to me about where, where is the bottom of your swing? The bottom of your swing really happens underneath the base of your neck. And so a lot of people, because their instinct, their subconscious is trying to get the ball in the air, they lean backwards away from the target to hit it up. But all that does is it moves the bottom of their swing to the right if for a right-hander and they get too much sand. So from a setup posture standpoint, I try to tip my upper body to the left when I'm playing this type of shot. And honestly, most shots around the green. Because if I can if I can maintain my posture, keep my uh, low point in my swing at the front edge of the ball instead of the back edge or maybe three inches behind the ball, which a lot of people do, then the contact becomes more consistent. 
And it's that consistent contact that really allows people to have their touch get good. As far as as far as the finish of the swing, uh, I'm I'm a big proponent of uh, we we play golf swinging in a circle, and I love to ask people which direction is the follow through, and you know I know that probably half the people will say well at the target, and the half that doesn't say that they're swinging as if that's what they believe they just know better with their answer. And really, the follow-through in golf is off to the left because it's a circular swing because the ball's out in front of us. Define that a little bit more when you're saying off to the left. And now, and now it's hard. I understand it's it's difficult to do on an audio conversation without pictures, without video. But can you describe better what you mean by that for me? Well, when we set up to a golf ball, it's out in front of us. And we're holding on to a club, and the shaft is hanging at a tilt. So when you hear people say, swing on plane, all they mean is to swing the shaft of the club in a circle and maintain the tilt that you have at a dress. And I'm not saying that's it's perfect along those lines, but that's a good picture if you can put that in your head. So if you swing in a circle on a tilted plane, when you go back, it'll go back behind you. And when you go through, it'll come back around behind you again. And a lot of people will chase their hands and the, and the club head toward the target instead of allowing it to go on around to the left. And, and if you swung all the way to the top, it would the club would go around behind you simply because you're swinging on a tilted circle. So do you find that most people, um, they don't complete their follow-through, or they just, they're, they're going in the wrong direction with it? Well, I love, I love stealing little quotes and ideas from my friends, and Jim, oh, Hardy's, one of, Jim Hardy's one of my best buddies. Great. And I, I pull these little nuggets out of his stories, and I think he would probably admit that he doesn't create everything he says either, but <laughs> it's nice hanging around with wise people that's been around longer than you have, and and one of the nuggets I pulled away is he, he said one time in a story that the target may be the greatest interrupter of good golf. Wow. And his point in saying that was that we're playing a game that requires you to swing in a circle. If you lean toward the target, if your hands drive out toward the target, if the club head swings out toward the target, you've interrupted the natural circle. And so for me, I, I swung on the natural circle with my short game. But I knew as soon as he said that, my long game, which is the part of the game I had struggled with a big piece of my career, I was moving my body and my club too much toward the target. I wasn't just swinging circular, you know, in a circle and letting that take care of the ball flying where I was looking. Wow. <laughs> I got to say, I Jim, just had a huge re- revelation. And Jim, Jim actually asked me to go to the range and smash golf balls on the range, but desperately try not to aim and figure out where they're going. And that helped my ball striking so much because they immediately went way to the right of where I thought they should go. But I found out that, you know, my swing flaw had really adjusted my aim for a pull hook and once I just swung away and the ball flew true I was aimed much too far to the right and I think that's a great exercise for for folks if they you know it's important to aim but now because I practice without aiming I know how to aim for a good shot I had been practicing aim poorly. So I had grooved the fact that I needed to hit a bad shot to go toward my target. Interesting. So then let's define aim. What is it specifically that we're aiming? Oh, gotcha. that's tricky, but, gotcha. but I would say <laughs> I, aim, I aim the ball. If once my instinct knows where the ball's going to go, I better know where to stand. 
I think what I had done was I had stood where I thought I was supposed to be, which actually ended up being incorrect. And so I had to groove a shot that wasn't very good in order to go where I was needing to go because I was standing in the wrong place. It's so interesting. If that makes any sense to the listeners, boy, they're good for them because I, I confused myself <laughs> with that one. But that's okay. We play a tough game. I know because, well, I just find it so interesting that you talk about how you had a very good short game, but you needed to work on your long game to to balance out everything, right? I mean, to, to play I, competitively, I, I you've still, got to find all parts I, of your game. Yeah, and I still... I, I know for a fact because I lived it and I watch tour players all the time. The genius behind the guys you watch on TV is they are so thirsty to get better. And the part of my game was I was thirsty to get better at hitting the ball because I was taught so well as a young player that my short game was excellent. But my long game, I always had this feeling down deep inside that it's, it has to be easier. Well, truthfully, as I went along and I played my career, I think the search to hit it better is probably what drove me away from being a tour player because I I believe in my heart, had I only practiced my short game, I might have survived as a tour player. I might not have ever gotten above 100th, 100th on the money list, but I might not have fallen off either because I sacrificed what I was good at chasing what I was bad at. And I see that a lot on tour because, and that's not a wrong thing. I, you know, I don't regret that, but it's easy to see that happening. And, uh, you know, there's countless tour players that have gone off to work with a new swing coach thinking for all the right reasons, that's going to help them. And it, and it hurt them a lot. I, part of the thing about golf that digs so deep into every player's soul, whether they're competitive or not, is this, I don't know if it's a thirst for knowledge or of a thirst for improvement. Is there, I, I, there is a difference there, right? I, I honestly know in my heart that the, the thirst to get better was, was better than the competition. Explain as much it. as I yeah. as much as I enjoyed playing the tour, I think I loved trying to get better. I love being coached. I love getting out there with me and my golf balls and my shag bag and being creative. And so the pursuit of getting better, I think, was the was the coolest part of the whole puzzle. The hunt, not the kill, huh? That that's right. Interesting. That's really interesting. You know, you you dropped a name already. You talked about being on the tour. Um, in your your primary function, you're, you're a coach or you're a tour player. I'm a coach. Okay, and some of the people I, I you've have worked moved, with, I have moved away from being a player. Uh, and I would, other than last week, I could almost say completely. But uh, I don't know if you're aware of last week the PGA was at uh, Greyhawk where I teach the fries.com open and just kind of on a whim, I went to the Monday qualifier where they, they play for four spots. There was about 80 guys and posted 65 Mm. and I earned one of those spots. So last week I found myself in a tour event for the first time in about three years. Wow. And it was fun. And I would say relative to my skill level at the moment, I performed nicely uh, the fact remains they gave away $5 million and I didn't get any. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, as well as I played, if you do that very long, you, you're thinking, wow, at least when I teach, they pay me. <laughs> and and they have this excitement on their face, and that puts an excitement on my face. And so I love the rush of helping people. And I'm 47. I think I'll play a few more tournaments, possibly you know, when I turn 50, I'll, I'll play some on the Champions of Tour, but I love what I do. I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. Well, rest assured that probably every person listening didn't get any of that $5 million either. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I doubt that a whole bunch of the tour players are gonna are gonna be looking for my podcast, but but hopefully a bunch of people that are trying to get better uh, will definitely tune in. And hopefully you fall into one of those categories, either a tour player or someone who wants to improve. Now, we're breaking here to say that we have another 25 minutes left with Stan, and you can hear it next week. Included are some questions submitted by those of you who have been social networking with on the FootJoy community forum. Here's just a taste of a part of what you'll hear next week with Stan Utley. I think the key there, that 20 to 60 yard shot, that I really have people try to understand is that I want to swing the grip into the club and my arms at a minimum. And I want to begin to really control the distance of the shot with my pivot or the turning of my body. Now, that's not to say that I'm not going to move the club head with my wrist and my arms some, but I don't want my hands raising the grip up by my shoulders in the back swing or real high on the follow through. Because what happens is when your arm swing gets big, that's what leads to decelling. If I can keep my arm swing small, that allows me to turn my body and play the shots with an aggressive attack on the ball. Once people capture that feeling and they actually compress the ball, that's what leads them to say, can you teach me to hit a seven iron like that? (laughs) 